All right, so we have a police officer use the motion detector to indicate whether a car is traveling faster than the speed limit. So a speeding ticket will be issued to the driver of the car if the officer believes the driver is speeding, as indicated by the detector. So the situation is similar to using a null and alternative hypothesis to decide whether to issue a ticket. So the hypothesis can be stated as follows. The null hypothesis would be that the driver is not speeding, and the alternative would be that the driver is speeding. So which of the following best describes the power of the test? Okay, so there's usually always gonna be like maybe one multiple choice question on the AP exam on power. Um, and power tends to be a complicated um, concept when you try to get into the math and you know calculations involved. So what I like to advise is just to keep it simple in a, in a simple way though. Um, the simplest way I could, um, I, would, I would state it and think of power is, power is basically, um, the probability that you're going to come to the correct conclusion. The power is basically like you want to, whenever you're doing a, you know, running a inference method, you want to make the correct conclusion, whether that be to reject null hypothesis or whether that be to fail to reject null hypothesis. Um, so power is basically a measure of how, uh, of, of how strong that you're going to, of how strong you're going to come to the correct conclusion. In other words, when you hear power, think of the correct conclusion. Okay, so. Let's see which of these would make sense. The probability of issuing a ticket to the driver who is speeding. Um, so I mean, that's your answer right here, but let's look at the other ones, why they're not. Because this is, this is doing the correct thing. If a driver is speeding, then you should issue them a ticket. So the, the power is gonna be the probability of, of again, doing the right of, of coming to the correct conclusion. Let's look at B, the probability of issuing a ticket to a driver who is not speeding. See, that, that, would be an, that would be a mistake. That would be incorrect. That's the wrong conclusion. You don't want to issue a ticket to a driver who's not speeding. Um, C, the probability of not issuing a ticket to a driver who is speeding. Again, that's not the correct conclusion. D, the probability of not issuing a ticket who is not speeding. Um, we don't care about that because, because um, remember, we want to figure out people who um, are speeding. So that technically is the right thing to do, but that's... Um, you don't have to do anything to not do that, I guess, like, you know, and the probability of the no motion detector is not working correctly. So anyways, my answer is gonna be A. All right, so an agricultural, was a big paragraph, an agricultural scientist wants to compare the effect of a new fertilizer to that of the three older fertilizers, X, Y, and Z, on the growth of vegetables typically grown in small gardens. 200 of 200 green beans, green bean seedlings were individually planted in identical pot, pots and randomly assigned to one of four groups of 50 each. Seedlings in one group were given the new fertilizer and the three remaining groups of seedlings were given fertilizers X, Y, or Z, respectively. At the end of four weeks, all seedlings were, all, all seedlings were dried and weighed. The scientists found that the mean weight of the seedlings in the group given the fertilizer, the new fertilizer, let's circle that, was significantly greater than the mean of the weights of the seedlings in the other three groups, the X, Y, and Z. So the co scientists conclude that the new fertilizer was more effective than the other fertilizers for all vegetables. So it's, this is, uh, pay attention to whenever you see those types of words. Why is the scientist's conclusion not appropriate? Well, I mean, again, you can see that um, he's applying it. Why? This is going to be my guess before going into the answers. He's, he's basically saying this works for all vegetables, but he only really tested um, the green bean seedlings, <laughs> whatever the heck. I guess the green, that's, that's where green beans come from. So you can't, you know, apply this to all vegetables because people argue reasonably so that green bean seedlings, you know, are, may react differently to this fertilizer than all vegetables. So um, let's look at which one would not be, which of these would not be, um, which of these would basically show this. So 30, so the study was observational, so cause and effect. Well, it wasn't observational, so we can't go with that. That's not going to be A or B. The experiment only included green beans, so the results can be gen can't be generalized to all vegetables. Yeah, so that's what we're going with. That's 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 going to be our answer. Um, let's go 38. All right, so this is a this one's going to be a little overwhelming if you try to you know think that you need to know physics, but here we go. So in a physics experiment. Two different methods were used to measure the angle of deflection when a subatomic particle collides with a certain material. Ten specimens of the material were used to compare the two methods. For each specimen, the angle of deflection was measured. So we're measuring the angle of deflection using both methods. For each specimen, the method used first was determined by the flip of a coin. 
flip of a fair coin, the difference between the measured angles was calculated for each specimen. A test of the hypothesis for the population mean difference is zero had a p-value of 0 0.08, a 0 0.082. The hypothesis test described had three components, the number of specimens, the sample standard deviation of the differences, and the magnitude of the sample mean difference. Compare the test described, which of the following would have resulted in a smaller p-value. Okay, so let's just kind of break down what this looks like in general when we're running a significance test. So um, let's just, let me kind of break out our table. So remember, we're going to have, you know, a standardized test statistic in this case, since we're dealing with um, means, probably going to have T, T is going to be equal to our statistic, which is going to be our differences in sample means minus our parameter, which is going to, we're going to assume that there's no difference, so it minus zero over the standard error of the statistics. So we're going to, you're going to use a combination of these formulas to make our test statistic. So it's going to be on top is, you know, we'll just have our differences between sample means. We'll just say x1 minus x2 bar uh, minus our null hypothesis mean, which we're saying that there's no, um, we're assuming that there's no difference. So the mean, or the mean difference is zero, so our, our parameter value will be zero. Our standard deviation, our standard error, technically speaking, we're going to use this because we're trying to find a difference between sample means. Or we're trying to estimate what well, difference in population means, but we're going to use our sample um, to estimate it. So we're going to have that's sub one squared over x over sample size one plus the sample standard deviation of the second sample over the second sample size. Okay, so what, let's see what's going on here. So the number of specimens and the sample standard deviation of differences remain the same, and but the magnitude of the sample mean difference was smaller. So we're trying to again find a smaller p value. So let's think again what that means. If you want to find a smaller p-value, let's actually draw like a, uh, a normal curve. Remember our p-value, or our test statistic, let's say it's here, p-value is the area to the, to the right or left of, of our test statistic. So to find out, if we want to get a smaller p-value, you want to get a larger t, because the, the more t goes to the right, the smaller that area will be. So we want to find what would make this expression bigger what would result in a bigger um, value? So um, <clears throat> if the sample standard deviations of the difference stay the same, but the magnitude of the sample mean difference was smaller, so if this was smaller, this whole thing would get smaller because um, if the numerator is smaller, you know, t will be smaller. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be a. Remember, we want to make, we want to find how we can make this equation bigger or this expression bigger. The number of specimens and the magnitude of the sample mean difference remain the same. So n and again our denominator remains the same, but uh, our sorry our de, our n's our n1 and n2 remain the same and this remains the same. So this, but the sample standard deviations were bigger. So these two values get bigger. Now that's actually going to make t smaller because if you have um, a number being divided by a bigger number like then it's going to get smaller so like let's just say the top let's just say for example it was let's say the top was 10. if it says that's 10 if you divide 10 over 100 you know that's one tenth but if you divide 10 over a thousand it becomes smaller so by making the denominators bigger the heat value gets smaller so it's not going to be b the number of specimens remain the same so the n1 and n2 stay the same but the magnitude of the sample mean difference was smaller and the sample standard deviations was larger. Okay, so this became smaller and it's saying that these became larger. So um, same thing, it's not gonna, um, it's still gonna make the whole thing smaller. If this is smaller and this gets larger, the whole thing gets smaller. So that's kind of a combination of the two. Okay, and the number of specimens remain the same, so n1 and n2 stay the same, but the magnitude of the sample mean difference was larger, and the sample standard deviation of the difference is smaller. Okay, so this looks like it'll be it. So um, if these values get smaller, that means the whole denominator gets smaller, 
So even as the top stays the same, dividing a number by, by, by a smaller number makes the overall number bigger. So for example, if we had the top was 10, 10 divided by 100, you know, it's one tenth. But if we go 10 divided by 10, you know, this becomes smaller, the whole value gets bigger. 10 over 10 is bigger than 10 over 100. So their answer is going to be D. All right, almost to the last two. All right, let's see. All right, polling agency reported that 60%, 66% of adults living in the U.S. were satisfied with their health care plans. The estimate was taken from a random sample of 15, 1,542 adults in the U.S. And 95% confidence interval for the population proportion was calculated to be 0.636 to 0.64. Which of the following statements is the correct interpretation of 95% confidence level? Okay, so level, not interval. So be careful. that's probably where they're trying to get you. So let's look what we got. So um, the probability is 95. Well, I thought, um, well, let's keep on going, actually. So the probability is 0.95 that the percent of adults Living in the U.S. who are satisfied with their health care plan is between 63.6% and 68.5%. So no, um, they're like the way to evaluate on when you're studying this. Remember, there actually is a true percent. Um, there is there's a true value that there's a true value that is the real percent of adults that are satisfied with their health care. So it's not like it's a probability. It's it's like if you it's just think of it like like um let's say you let's talk about your height let's, let's say if you're five foot eight it's not like you're going to have a 95 percent chance of being five foot seven or 95 percent chance of being five foot eight or 95 percent chance of being five foot nine you're five foot eight it's a fact it's not going to be a probability so like we don't want to think of it like that so b approximately 95 percent of the random samples of the same size will result in the common interval that includes a portion of all adults living who, who are satisfied with their health care plans yeah, so this is what confidence level describes. It would be B. Um, remember, confidence level is basically um, um, how do you say it? it's 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 a value that tells you that if you were to um, use that method, if you were to use a method that you to make the confidence interval over and over and over, let's say you use the same method to construct ten thousand confidence intervals, then about ninety five percent of those 10,000 common intervals that actually capture the true population proportion. So um, there would be B. All right, last one. All right, um, a Coast survey was conducted in a large city to investigate public opinion on banning the use of trans fats in restaurant cooking. A random sample of 230 city resident, residents with school aged children was selected, and another random sample of 340 city residents without school aged children was also selected. Of those with school-aged children, 94 opposed the banning of trans fat, and of those without school-aged children, 147 opposed the banning of trans fat. An appropriate hypothesis test was conducted to investigate whether there is a difference or was a difference between the two groups of residents in their opposition of banning trans fats. Is there convincing statistical evidence of a difference between the two population proportions at the significance level of 0.05? Um, okay, so we're essentially doing an inference test. So um, you can actually do this in your calculator because you're actually giving all the statistics. So you would go to stat, go to test, and you're going to go ahead and run. We're talking about proportions of two sample or two prop z tests, I should say. Not interval, that would be like a confidence interval. So two prop z tests from my, this calculator is six. And we have, you know, there are two samples. So we'll go, the first one is, um, remember, X1 will be the number of successes. So uh, the school age children, 147. So 147 out of the 230 would put for that first one. And X2 would be um, the 90 of those with school age children. Oh no, that's the school age children, that should be 94 out of the 230. And then the other one is um, those without school age children, 147 out of the 341. And we're trying to see if there's um, 
a difference. So if there's, there's, there's a difference, we just have to find, we were gonna select that P1 is not equal to P2. And this is gonna do all the work for you. It's pretty convenient. So it gives us our Z value or of negative 0.53, gives us a P value of 0.59. So that's much, that's very large. It's almost 0.6. So that p-value is bigger than our alpha level. It's, it's, it's 60%, our alpha level is 5%. So we're gonna reject the null hypothesis and essentially we're gonna say that um, we don't have convincing evidence that there actually is a difference. So um, let's look at what answer would make the sense. So is there convincing statistical evidence? So it would first be no. So we know it's not gonna be A, B, or C. No, because the probability of observing a difference of at least as large as the sample difference if the two population pro proportions are the same is greater than 0.05. That would be B, it would be D. Remember, the p-value tells you, or the p-value is the probability, and it assumes that the null hypothesis is true. So it assumes that um, that there is a difference. So it's basically saying that if there was a difference, then you would have about 60% chance of observing a difference this greater greater. So um, it's, so E would be the probability of the at least as large as the sample's difference is less. Than, so then, yeah, that it's kind of doing the opposite. So our answer, our answer would be D.